We're gonna give away stuff. Here you go. Ah, there you go. See you guys. Right. I share challenge. Definitely post, 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 post. Good evening. Happy Sabbath. One more time. Happy Sabbath. All right. Tonight, I have the privilege of presenting our guest speaker who flew in all the way from the Philippines. Woo! <laughs> and so I actually met her, she's right here, for the first time when I picked her up on Monday from LAX. And I actually wasn't sure what to expect, and I didn't even really know what she looked like. And so I remember going on Facebook, trying to make sure I can recognize her, trying to see what she looked like so I can find her at the airport. And so on her Facebook, I saw that she spoke German, French, Spanish, Italian, English, Tagalog, and even Olongo, which is a dialect in the Philippines. And then I also saw that she was a, a nurse. She did nursing. Um, she is also the co-founder of a modest clothing company called Suravia. And she was also the winner of Miss Earth. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, Man, who am I picking up? <laughs> so throughout our interaction throughout the week, in the last few days, um, I've actually found Miss Earth to be pretty down to earth. <laughs> so you should try to talk to her when you get a chance after she presents. She's actually one of the most honest, empathetic, um, God-fearing beauty queen winners that I've ever met. Um, to be honest, I think she's actually the only Christian, Christian beauty queen winner that I've met. So. Um, tonight, she has a special message for each of us. Uh, it's her testimony that she's going to share. And so without further ado, I just want to present to you, Sandra Seihert. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Um, you know, Alex and I have a really unique relationship. Um, on Monday, we were strangers. And on Thursday, pretty much yesterday, we became roomies. So it's really a quick relationship, but she's great. And I thank her for that wonderful intro. Um, more importantly, I want to first and foremost wish everyone a happy Sabbath. Um, to be honest, I, uh, I don't live in the States, but um, you know, God brought me here. And I've traveled 12,000 kilometers. <laughs> Um, and if you convert that into miles, that's around 7,000 plus miles to be here. So um, talk about pressure and a message that I have to bring from the other side of the world over here. But I really want to thank the Lord for this opportunity to be part of his work. And um, uh, I honestly, I was actually invited to come over here last year already. But uh, due to timing, it was not yet God's perfect time. And I'm thankful that it is today. And I also want to thank um, Mike and Candace Tuazon for having me here, for discovering me on social media and uh, the love um, of the work I do for the Lord. And um, yeah, before I get started, I just want to invite all of you to join me in prayer um, as um, we uh, approach this message that I would like to share with you, my testimony. All right, shall we pray? Our most loving Heavenly Father, I humbly thank you so much for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is what separates us from so many other faiths. And I thank you that we have this day with you and that you've brought us from different places. Um, some of us have traveled um, thousands of miles and um, some of us are within the vicinity of this wonderful little town to be here. And I thank you, Lord, because I know this is um, your, your will that we are here today something and someone has moved us to be here and we have um, set aside um, our worldly priorities and um, some of us have even had to go through certain sacrifices to be here um, all to to seek you lord so i pray with all my heart that we would all be open to receiving the holy spirit may he fill us as we've learned last night with the power um, that we require to to know you and to understand how much you love us and i pray that in a simple way my testimony can be a blessing to these wonderful souls um, that have gathered in front of me lord prepare their hearts and their minds and also lord thank you for um 
making this entire experience a blessing to me personally. I have rediscovered what it means to be loved by a wonderful God like you, and um, there have been tears of joy throughout the first few days of my stay here, and I thank you, Lord, for bringing me here. Um, all these things we pray with also the request for forgiveness of our sins and pardon. In Jesus' sweet name, amen. All right. So... Um, as I said, I've traveled this far, um, and I want to give you guys a little background on um, how this all started. Because unlike most of you, or many of you, who were born Adventists, I actually was born Catholic. And um, the interesting part is, although I was born Catholic in um, Taipei, Taiwan, I was actually born at a Seventh-day Adventist hospital. So um, my, my mom is Filipino. And my dad is German. And I have three younger siblings who are all taller than me because they're guys. Um, but yeah, through my wonderful parents, I was able to grow up um, and blessed to have traveled a lot. And um, I've been exposed to different kinds of cultures. And that's probably also why I speak so many languages. But it really allowed me to develop an open mind and to be respectful to other cultures. It wasn't until the age of 16, though, that um, I had my very first, I want to call it my very first gripping Seventh-day Adventist Bible study. Because remember, I was Catholic, right? So I wasn't really exposed to Bible study. I would go to church on Sunday, and um, yeah, that was pretty much it. You know, live a normal, worldly kind of life. But in 2000, I had my first um, Bible study that really hooked me. And there were three truths during that Bible study that captured me. The first one was the truth about the Sabbath. When I heard that Sunday was not the true Sabbath day, um, according to the Bible, I was like, wait, what? It's not? And so I went home and I researched history and I went over, you know, how Constantine, Emperor Constantine tried to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday um, in uh, 538, I believe, um, AD. So I was like, wow, this is true. And uh, I was really hooked. In fact, that actually led me, because I was a student at the time, finishing up my um, international baccalaureate in Manila. I was a student, and I wanted to share this with people, because I was so hooked by the, the true Sabbath versus Sunday that I actually wrote my final thesis paper on this topic, and uh, yeah, I really took a risk because um, I had a good GPA, but um, I thought, you know, this paper is a pass or fail, so if I can just back it up with good research, I can write this paper and maybe be a blessing even to just that one person who will be reading it, who happens to be Catholic, actually. <laughs> but I took the risk and I said, you know what? The light is too beautiful to be kept, to be hidden. I know about this. I want to share it. So I try to do that as a student, and you know, you guys are also students, you might be going back to school, so think of creative ways where you can also share that light. So that was the first thing that gripped me. The second um, light, I should say, uh, that is very unique to Sunday Adventism is prophecy, right? Um, we have the spirit of prophecy. We have the light and the greater light, right? The spirit of prophecy books written by Ellen White, who I am a fan of, I have <laughs> and, um, you know, I was just amazed how, like, Daniel's dream um, was a prophecy of all these kingdoms that would um, rule on earth and how we are living at the bottom of that image. Um, and so I was really, really amazed. And I just wanted to know more and more about it. And the third light that really blessed me from th this Bible study which became a series, was the beauty of the health message. The temperance that someone like Daniel had during his time, um, which also led me to discover the eight laws of health, right? Are you guys familiar with the eight laws of health? Good. Um, are you guys practicing the eight laws of health? <laughs> kind of? <laughs> All right, well, let's work on those, because they will really, truly... Um, prepare us for these last days. But I was really, really um, blessed by these truths, these top three truths, at the age of 
Very good. See the benefits of sitting in the front row? <laughs> They're really listening. But I'm, I'm sure all of you um, are, are following because, after all, we are led by the Spirit. So, um, since I knew these truths, I really wanted to apply them. So I had, you know, I'd written that research paper, um, and I pretty much turned vegetarian overnight. I was so motivated. I was like, oh, I'm saying no to all these flesh foods and any food that will corrupt my mind and temple. So I did that for about two weeks, and then <laughs> I couldn't resist. I was craving a McDonald's cheeseburger, so I ran. I'm sorry, I don't think I should be mentioning brands, but that's the truth. <laughs> I really craved those burgers, and I literally like ran to the mall, and I had two of them with my french fries stuffed in between them, really eating them so joyfully until I was done. And then I told myself, you know what? You know, I had it. I'm satisfied, and you know what? I'm not going to have another burger ever again. I satisfied my craving, and I just, you know, it was good, but it wasn't as good as I thought it would be. So uh, I decided to go full force vegetarian, um, never looked back, and now it's been 18 years. So time just really flies, um, but God assists, and He'll really help you, imp you know, improve your health and um, help you to have the courage to stand for these kinds of decisions. Because remember, we're living in the last days, and um, I also get really curious about um, the, how food is produced nowadays. Anytime I have a chance, I also try to watch documentaries. We're, we're very privileged to have um, access to. Um, uh, resources like Netflix, for example, where there are some great documentaries, and they do the research for you, so you kind of just learn from them, and you start to connect the dots, and you see how everything now is like a business, right? Um, the food industry has become a large-scale business, and um, it's really sad because if you look deeper into it, people nowadays, especially uh, the people on the production side, really also are more concerned about the financial profit than the health profit of the people that they're serving. So we really have to be mindful of what we're um, partaking, you know, to protect our temples. Now, going back to my testimony, um, what had happened is I had applied these truths to my life, and um, it almost uh, five years later, I finally had to go to college, because I was still in high school at the time when I did this Bible study, so I moved to New York, and I started to um, find my Adventist community in New York. I was still vegetarian, I was still keeping the Sabbath, and eventually, as I became active in New York in the church there, um, I finally decided to get baptized in 2008. So here's a photo that you can see up on screen of me getting baptized as a Seventh-day um, Adventist um, church in Manhattan. And um, it was really a blessing. In fact, I got baptized together with my mom. It was funny because when I told her I, I really wanted to get baptized and serve the Lord full force, she was like, wait, uh, but I'm your mom. I should get baptized before you. I should be setting the example. So let me get baptized first, and then you can get immersed after, okay? <laughs> and then I was like, with all due respect, mom, okay, but it's a calling, and as long as you're ready and convicted and you know what you stand for, then yeah, by all means, amen, you know, let's do it together. So my mom and I got baptized together in New York. It was also in New York that I uh, pursued my college education, and in 2009, a year later, after getting baptized, I graduated as a registered nurse, um, and I took the NCLEX, and thankfully I also passed. Now, I must be honest with you guys. I took nursing mainly because I come from a family of nurses, and I have two aunties in New York that, you know, they're, they're living a really satisfied life as nurses, so they were telling me, you know what? you should also take nursing. And we know you love fashion and the arts, but you can always do that after. Do nursing first. Um, in retrospect, I realize now that um, it is really a blessing in disguise because um, although I may not be a nurse right now, um, my nursing degree gives me the credibility that I need when I speak about the health message. Amen? Yeah, so um, it's, it's really wonderful how like that became a blessing to me after all, especially in the ministry. 
Um, and then one, while I was in New York, I had been achieving all these things, you know, my getting my degree done. Um, I've been also traveling while I was there. And then I even became president of the National Honor Society Phi Theta Kappa. And I was like um, an exemplary student. We have a um, student community of 20,000 students. At least at that time, we were 20,000. Um, the college is called Board of Manhattan Community College. And um, yeah, I was really thankful that I was um, even chosen to be the, the president of the Honor Society. Uh, so a lot of this like really made me, I must admit, a lot of this made me feel really proud and confident of myself. I was like, wow, I'm smart. You know, I can do this. And um, thank you, Lord. But like, yeah, I also had to study hard for these things so there was this sort of like taking credit for myself kind of mentality it also started to, to sink in right and the reason I mention that is because this type of mentality like what how I felt how how good I was started to subtly grow in me and uh, once I accomplished all these great academic achievements in New York I returned to the Philippines because I was an international student in New York, and it was, it was time to go home because I got my degree. And I started to become really curious about what else I can achieve. Like, there's so many things I can achieve. I have a New York education, and um, also, you know, the, the devil works in really interesting ways. Like, he tries to lure us, n not abruptly, but very subtly. Um, and I think that was, like, one of his temptations, to be honest. Um, he actually sent people to encourage me to join a beauty pageant. And that's what I did eventually. I, I, I prayed for it. Um, and then uh, I had all the, the contacts and all the things that I needed to actually join. Um, there were designers that wanted to dress me up for the pageant, etc., etc. And um, I had trainers and mentors. They were all in. And they wanted you know, me to represent the Philippines once I won. So... Basically, out of curiosity, I, I decided to eventually join. And remember, I was already baptized in New York, right? But um, I'd say I was like one foot in the world and one foot, you know, on the narrow straight path. Like I was always kind of on both, both sides. I wasn't really like firm in the Lord. Um, I was still curious. I wanted to know if the grass was greener on the other side. And I'd, I'd see all these you know, beautiful girls um, on TV growing up, and they all, you know, want to be beauty queens, and they won, and I would tell myself, oh, I can be like that too one day. So this is my chance. I finished my education. Let me go join. And lo and behold, I joined a national pageant, which is focused on um, protecting the environment. It's called Miss Philippines Earth. And for me, while I was in the pageant as a candidate, I was just happy with the wisdom and the knowledge that I obtained regarding the environment. But, you know, it went so much further than that because I actually won the crown locally. So that was my first um, time to join a pageant, and I actually won in 2009. Now, this victory led to me um, having to represent the entire Philippines in the international pageant, um, which is just Miss Earth. And um, that's where I was up against 85 other beautiful women from all around the world that also won in their own local countries. Um, so I was up against Miss uh, USA Earth or Miss Germany Earth. So there were all these different women, and they were all beautiful, tall, um, you know, wonderfully f um, built physically. And, you know, it was really interesting to discover how... As I was competing against them, we had these um, short contests in between uh, among each other. Uh, who won the best dress? Who, who had the best um, body and swimsuit? And it's really ironic because we were so many, but I would always win best in swimsuit and best in long gown. In fact, here's a little trivia for you. Can you guys guess how much this dress cost that I was wearing? Because I'm the one in the middle, by the way. Does anyone want to take a guess how much this dress cost? $2,000. $10,000. No, try to be like as wise as you can be. $5. <laughs> okay, well, to be honest, 
This dress was designed by a Filipino designer who's based in Dubai. He's world renowned now. He dresses red carpet celebrities like Lady Gaga um, and uh, all these other Hollywood stars, J Lo. Um, he actually dressed me up. This dress was already purchased and just lent to me for the pageant. And the price for this dress is $20,000. In the Philippines, that's like about a, a million pesos. And it's fully beaded Swarovskis. It really is a beautiful piece and handcrafted. And he's known for this kind of design. But um, all I could say was like, that is way too much, right, for a dress. That is like pure extravagance, pure vanity. But it was the key for me to win best in long gown. In fact, I didn't just win best in long gown and best in swimsuit. I also won Miss Earth Air in 2009. So that gives me two crowns um, and you know after this like okay I got my US education I won two crowns like that just opened the doors to so many other opportunities and remember I had gotten baptized but I was still so exposed to this world that we sometimes really fantasize about especially the young women we really want to be part of this glamorous world and so I went from photo shoot to photo shoot you know getting dolled up every day um, you know wearing good makeup beautiful clothes you know from pageant stage to runways to covers and even to international campaigns for PETA for instance um, you know you name it, I had it. And like, I also was on um, international television. I was not just competing in pageants. I was actually moderating and hosting the pageants. And I even got to rub elbows with really like world-class celebrities, including Scooter Brown, who's manager of Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande. You know, I've met Sam Smith. I even got to hang out with top athletes like Manny Pacquiao. So it was really like everything. I was like, you name it, I had it in the bag, you know? And I was so... Like I was just living that life, you know, that life that we can only dream of. And so I wanted to get smart now. Now that I was like up there, what I do with like this fame, this fortune, these contacts. And so I started um, a business venture because now I want to get business minded um, with another beauty queen. And we start to launch a swimwear line. So I don't know about that part where I got baptized again, but here I suddenly was, you know, selling bikinis. Where did, where did, that, you know, where did I go wrong? Or what happened, you know, in such a small amount of time? Um, and so you would really think I had it all, right? The fame, the fortune, like the, the, the money, the businesses. Am I missing anything? Am I missing anything in terms of like what else I should be having? Well, let me tell you this, I am missing the boyfriend, am I not? Because, <laughs> you know, we, we can have career, we can have beauty, we can have money, but we also want to have that perfect, good-looking, rich guy to, you know, share with us, don't we? Well, guess what? I had him too. <laughs> I had a 10-year relationship with someone who respected me, who loved me, who supported me, who was looking, etc. You name it, he had it too. And there I was, frolicking around, breaching my dreams. Um, but to be honest, you know, even if here, here's little Sandra on earth, like enjoying her life, you know, the life that she thinks is great for her, God was not happy. He definitely was not happy. I'm thankful that he's... You know, he protected me and didn't, like, send me thunder, you know, on the spot. But, um, you know, God was not happy, and he made that known to me in his own special way. So I'll, I'll share with you how he did that. One Sabbath morning, I was invited to appear on national television as a guest. So it was a TV appearance, and I just had to perform one dance number. I would be done by 12 noon. And it was a pay after job, so I'd get my money instantly. So here I am, kind of keeping the Sabbath, but you know, also justifying to myself that if I do this job, there's two benefits to it. A, I can still go to church after and keep the Sabbath. And B, I'm getting paid on the spot, so I can also give this income to the Lord for tithes, right? 
So I, I just really tried to reason myself how I should be doing this job. It's just so enticing. I have to do it. But what happens? It actually backfired at me a few weeks later, because one of my friends from church suddenly asked me, "Hey, Sandra, were you、um, on national television dancing around on Sabbath a few weeks ago?" I thought no one would know because on Sabbath everyone's in church, so they wouldn't see me.、Um, but you know, I couldn't lie, so I said. Yeah, wh- why? How do you know this? And then he tells me, "Well, some Adventists saw you on TV, and they said, 'Isn't she Adventist? Why is she、um, on national TV live dancing around on Sabbath?'" And what did I say? The whiz that I was: "If they're Adventists, why are they watching TV?" <laughs> so on Sabbath, you know what I mean. So I was really like, you know, we tend to do that as human beings. Like we always start to point the finger at other people、um, when we know that we made the mistake clearly. It's just like, you know, Adam. I, when God came to him, he's like, okay, what did he do? It's like it was her fault, and then we see Eve here. It was the serpent's fault, you know. So we always point the finger, but that hit me. So. There were so many other ways that God could have hit me, but that really hit me.、Um, the second way He hit me was that I experienced betrayal in my business ventures. So clearly, I wasn't working with fellow Seventh-day Adventists; I was working with、um, unbelievers. So, you know, I was betrayed in that aspect, and it was a big downer. I was. Actually, depressed for six months to the point that I physically suffered from that, and I was experiencing alopecia. Do you guys know what alopecia is? Hair loss. Yeah, it's. I'm. I'm just lucky that I have enough hair to cover it, but I. It got to the size of a golf ball. Like that's how it affected me. Like being betrayed that way. Because growing up, you know, I had really good friends also who never would do something like that to me. But when it comes to business,、um, you know, people don't mess around when when、um, you know. They can earn a lot of money, and if you're in their way, so that was the second、uh, thing that hit me. And the third thing is just, you know, a lot of the people that I'd been meeting, like they started to backstab me, and you know, to get ahead themselves. And、uh, there weren't really any genuine relationships and friendships there in that entire industry, um, unfortunately. Um, so it was a really rough time for me, and. I was really starting to reassess, like what I wanted to do with my life, and if I was happy. Clearly, I was not happy. I mean, my body was even telling me that, like, this is a bad state to be in. And so I prayed,、um, and I'm really thankful that I, I decided to seek the Lord at that point. And I realized that the last time I was really happy, and something good was. Was going on in my life was during my baptism when I had accepted the Lord, which was a couple of years back already from where I was at, right?、Um, but you know, this was all I needed, I guess, for me to revisit、um, the Lord and His calling again. And ironically, it all happened when I turned 30 years old.、Um, so at 30, I decided to just. Brush up on my Bible to really go deep this this time around. As Pastor Alvin said last night, really go all in with God this time. Like no more one foot in the world, one foot on the narrow path. It's really just like get on that narrow path and go forward and serve God. So,、um, as I was reading the Bible, I also、uh, discovered a lot of answers to many questions I had from what my experience was in in this worldly environment. And I got one of my answers in Mark eight thirty six, which reads, "For what shall it profit a man or a woman if he or she shall gain the whole world and lose?" His own soul, right? So you can have it all. Like we always aspire for so many things while we don't have them. But what happens when you actually have them? I also want you to think about this for a moment. You know how we hear so many celebrities, so many musicians, athletes, like they have, you know, successful careers. They have a lot of money. They're traveling. They're living the life. But suddenly, we just open Facebook or read the news, and they commit suicide. Why? I gave a presentation once on this, and I, where I studied three people that really 
um, had a significant impact in the world, either by inventing the camera or um, you know, being influential. And they had all one thing in common, and that was that they committed suicide. And I realized from studying their background further that none of them had Jesus. None of them had Christ. Like, they were either atheists or they didn't really believe in Christ. So it's really like, um, you know, possible to have it all but still be depressed or sad and eventually, you know, not have it all. Because the truth is, someone once told me that our hearts are designed in such a way that there is um, a part that only Jesus can fill. And it is our, we were designed, it is our purpose to actually find our creator and worship him, right? So if ever you are in that position where you're searching for um, purpose, like I was, and really why you're here, and you know what you want to leave behind in this transient, fleeting, temporary world, the purpose is really to serve God, who loved us first, and who has like a really amazing plan for you and I. And so it also made me realize that everything is temporal in this world, and even the crown that I had, I would have to pass that on. It's not like I could hold on to it and wear it forever, which would really be uncomfortable because it's heavy. <laughs> and I don't really like wearing the crown, to be honest. But um, yeah, it's just an earthly crown that will be passed on. It's not permanent, right? And um, here's a, one nice um, statement for you, since they were talking earlier about how we should pay attention to speaker statements. Uh, one of mine is an earthly crown does not compare to a heavenly crown. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so imagine I had all these earthly crowns and it just doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter uh, because it's going to fade away anyway. And there's going to be another beauty queen after me, then another one. And also like when we leave this world, like it won't matter. So that made me realize that I need to think long term. And this was further backed up by this beautiful verse in the Bible, Colossians 3.2, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, right? So with this in mind, I realized, wow, you know, I had been using my influence, my title to self-gratify, to earn money, to get attention, and whatnot, everything was all about me and just taking advantage in this worldly environment when, you know, what I should be doing is really focusing on my salvation and soul winning, right? Yeah, so with that, I continued reading, I continued searching, and I went from the Bible also to the spirit of prophecy, and here's one of the uh, verses, not verses, but like one of the passages, rather, in Ellen White's um, books that really blew me away. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. In case you didn't know, the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man, have been committed to them, the Seventh-day Adventists, to be given to the world. So you know how like God has his people, his chosen people in every generation? In the last days, we have the complete system of truth. We cover it all. We cover health, we cover Adventist home, family, love, Sabbath, prophecy, you name it, we have it, right? And that's where I realized how blessed I am to actually be exposed to this light, to know this light, to have it in my arms, in my hands, and to um, live by it and to share it. So what I did was, like, you know, having this epiphany and re realization at 30 um, is, okay, it's not too late. Well, now I feel like it might have been too late to join Souls, because <laughs> I only found out about Souls now. But um, had I known earlier, right? If only I'd known earlier. <laughs> It would have been so different. <laughs> so yeah, this is an encouragement for all our soul gradu souls graduates to like really just go for it. You know, there are many lost Sandras out there that would, you know, be like dying to work in the Lord's vineyards. Just go get them, you know, with the grace of the Lord. But like, what I did do in the Philippines, 
um, is I started to share, you know, baby steps. Wherever I could, wherever God let le would lead me, I would start to share about the true Sabbath. We would go to certain areas, um, streets basically. We went to the streets. And um, it's really amazing because I have a group um, of friends. They're also um, from church. And we started to form this little community um, at the corner of a specific street. It's called um, Malate, the area. And every Sabbath after lunch, we would do a little bit of an outreach. And the way it works is we would um, gather these people and over the, you know, this is a two-year thing that we've been doing. And over the two years, they started to keep on coming, you know, these people. And, you know, they're homeless, but some of them have interesting stories. Like they used to be educated, they used to be in positions, but then something happened to them. So now they're on the streets and they would just come meet us there. And it's like a whole area. Um, they would even recognize the cars that we would drive in as we approach. And we would just have to roll open the window and they would be saying, happy Sabbath. It wasn't even us, like it was them first. And we would give them shirts that had um, Bible quotes about the Sabbath. And every time they would wear those shirts when we come, they would get an extra surprise from us. And what we would do is, it's really nice, we would give them a short Bible study. After that, we would give them food. like, And we want to make sure that they're doing it in order so they would line up. And then we would distribute um, food and sometimes even a little bit of um, pocket money, you know, just a small amount, but it's still better than nothing. And they would be so blessed. And we would do this um, Sabbath after Sabbath for two years um, and growing. And um, it's really, really nice to see the development. And now there's around almost, I think at our climax, we had like 200 people there. So yeah, it's, it's really, really a, a blessing even to us to, to share it to this community. And you know what, what touched me the most was sometimes we can't really make it because of logistics since the weather is so bad because we also have like really uh, bad rainy seasons there is um, even maybe if we can't make it to them, they're still there waiting and it, when it's pouring. So they come like rain or shine to, to meet us. I mean, they really don't have anything to lose, right? So what we would do to make up for that is we would just um, double up the next Sabbath when we can't come again. Then give them like double the food and maybe double the pocket money, you know, and then we let, them, we let them learn about the Lord. So that's one thing I did, right? We shared about the Sabbath there. And then moving on since uh remember i had this this nursing degree under my belt is i would share about health in different churches now so um the word spread that miss earth was um you know pretty active in these outreach programs so um churches after churches started to invite me so again remember we have this really wonderful um treasure of different truths right so we could share about the sabbath we can share about health and then when i get to an audience of children i really start to focus on how they should honor their parents you know because in the last days a lot of children will go against their parents it's one of the signs actually in revelation right so we need to be mindful of how important our parents are and that we should take good care of them too you know like um however we treat um our parents is a reflection of how we would treat christ so we really need to honor them and, and be there for them and respect them. So I try to teach these kids that. And um, again, if I could cover it all, why not? Like, where else are people that need the Lord? So we went to the prisons. Okay, so there are people in prison that need hope and looking for salvation too, right? Um, and they have so much time in their hands that uh, we decided, like, I even spent my birthday there with them. It's so funny because when I invited my friends to join me, I was like, hey, do you guys want to come to prison with me on my birthday? <laughs> and they were like, why are you going to prison? Did you do anything wrong? I was like, no, it's just I want to um, spend time with them. Like, we can feed them, we can talk about the Lord. And true enough, there's also, like, these wonderful testimonies um, developing within those presents, and we... we do return and visit them. So now they have their own Bible study groups and they start sharing. And um, it's really a, a wonderful blessing to me to be able to just, you know, use my influence this time around for the Lord. And, um, you know, God truly is amazing. And here's another verse that I want to share with you um, in James 4.10. If we really humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. So God actually 
did this. You know, as we are serving him, we don't even realize it, but he starts to lift you up. And from going uh, to the streets, to the prisons, um, to the kids, uh, all of a sudden, he started to take me in 2014 from those environments to like the masses. Okay, so like I had um, all these, um, for example, there was this one um, gathering of Seventh-day Adventists about 20,000 Seventh-day Adventists, Filipino Adventists, um, that were at one place, and all pastors wanted to speak there. It was like such a privilege to be able to speak there. But they wanted people like me to share my testimony, and, which really um, gave me the chills because I was like, why me? I, I don't memorize the Bible. Like, these people have been serving God all their lives. They should be speaking up there. Why me? But, you know, God just knows who to choose, and, I, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to share and witness to these people. And it goes on that way. Like, he sends me to different churches, um, and, like, the people are just really willing to listen, to grow. And it just, just a few um, photos so that you can get an idea. Like, we started in Metro Manila. We went to the provinces. Um, you know, it was like a seabed of multitudes, you know? And um, this is really a blessing because we, you know, you may start off with door to door, but you could end up this way too. You know, God has a plan. He knows where to use his, um, his people. So um, this doesn't just end in the Philippines. This even like leaked into um, invitations in Papua New Guinea. I mean, Papua New Guinea is not even on my bucket list, but God brought me there because, you know, these people also want to know the light. They're ready for it. So we need to share with them. And even the Middle East, which is like predominantly Muslim, I even got to share in Dubai twice. So it really is mind-blowing how God can use us if we let him, you know, and if we uh, use our talents for him, you know, he will really um, elevate you, if, especially if you are humble. And um, it also led to the United States. Two years ago, I was able to share at White Memorial and several um, uh, local Seventh-day Adventist churches. And I know some of my friends are here with us in the audience tonight um, that have invited me during that first visit. So I'm thankful that, you know, there's a continuation and here I am now sharing it. I share. But remember also how I used to rub elbows with all those celebrities? I still get to do that now, but more important celebrities like Doug Bachelor <laughs> or, of course, people like Michael and Candice Toisa. Like, you know, for me, I, like that, you know, that lights me up now. And I know like, that these pe people are like, on fire for the Lord. And um, that, that's what I'm looking for, to, to be surrounded by people that also want to serve the Lord. And so as I was serving the Lord and going from you know, places to places in the Philippines and around the world, I realized that I kept teaching a lot, sharing a lot, but I also had to catch myself um, and make sure that as I was sharing, I myself was living by example. Does that make sense? That I, and my heart was right as well. And I realized this because I came across a really nice um, statement in the book, Messages to Young People, page 131. If the heart is right, your words, your dress, your acts will all be right. Amen? Isn't this amazing? So it all starts with the heart, right? So there I am teaching, right? But as many of you, we may be teaching and telling people like how it's done, what to do, what God wants, but are we also living by example? Are we um, appropriate in our acts, our dress, and our ways? And um, that led me to reassess myself as well, because you can't forget yourself in the process of doing ministry and serving others, because you yourself also need to set a good example. Remember, when Jesus was on earth, he did more healing than preaching, right? It's easy to talk and tell people how it's done, but actually living by it is a whole other testimony, and it is powerful. So to, to live the light is really, really powerful, and I need to make sure that I was also living the light. So I rechecked. Um, when it comes to health, for example, as we know in 1 Corinthians 3.16, um, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. It was time for me to also reassess if I was um, still being healthful, and um, 
making sure that I wasn't,、um, you know, ingesting foods that would harm or damage me as a person. Because I had to live by example. Like people also see what I eat, and so if I would start eating these kinds of foods but preach health, it wouldn't really connect, right? So I also had to give up. Step by step, by God's grace,、um, these foods that are are dangerous. I mean, we may be vegetarian, but we may be like binging on desserts. So that's also <laughs> a risk, right?、Um, and so I was just trying to brush up on my health、um, wisdom, and I can only encourage you to do so as well, because it's one thing to be vegetarian, but we always want to level up. Amen. If you know something isn't good for you, why continue it? Next. Second Corinthians six fourteen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Was that a problem? A problem for me? Yes. Well, remember that ten year relationship I had with an unbeliever, who was so amazing, so handsome, etc. <laughs> well, as much as he supported me and let me do Bible studies, and I also tried to share with me, I、uh, share with him rather.、Um, I guess that he didn't. Seek the Lord on His own. Like I always had to encourage Him,、um, to the point where, you know, God just showed me that it was time to say goodbye to the relationship, not the friendship, but the relationship. Did I break up with Him? Yes, I did. Ten years is a marriage, right? That's like a long time. I grew up with Him in my twenties, but. You know, he respected that as well. It was very hard for him, also for me, but harder for him. But it was really like it required the sacrifice, and it was written in the world that we shouldn't be equally yoked with unbelievers. So I had to let that go. And then I also really got hit by this verse: First Timothy two nine to ten. In like manner also that women. I'm a woman. Adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but with which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So that's when I also realized, as I was searching about what God wanted、uh, me to, to be, that you know all that outward adorning, all that makeup, all that. Dressing up didn't matter to God. What mattered to God was really where my heart was at, and also how I could be of service to Him, and be of good influence as a woman. And so that led me to appreciate natural beauty. You know, keeping it simple, because you know we were all what's that verse in Psalms? Fearfully and wonderfully made. God designed for us to be. This way to have this kind of beauty for a purpose. So why change that? Why go through plastic surgery, implants, etc., makeup, face paint,、um, you know, all of that just to change how God naturally made you? You know, we are all beautiful. So embrace your beauty. Embrace your freckles. Embrace your dimples. <laughs>、um, embrace your moles. You know your height, whatever it may be, because、um, God made you that special way. So, with it, this powerful、um, verse in Timothy,、um, it jump-started a whole another level of my journey with the Lord. And、um, being a woman who's very inclined to fashion, I realized about the dangers of fashion. How the enemy uses fashion as a tool to damage our morality. And also our health, and that's why I—that's a whole other lecture. But that's why I went from the before to the after, Sandra, in terms of wardrobe. Okay, so I let go of the jewelry, almost let go of the makeup. I still wear the no makeup look makeup. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but it's like really, maybe if like tonight I'm standing in, in the spotlight, so it might make sense to have a little. But um, really, um, there I go justifying again, right? <laughs> But、um, honestly, like less is more, as I said, and really just transforming step by step. I know it wasn't going to be easy because remember, I had been wearing twenty thousand dollar dresses and really, you know, looking、um, outwardly. You know, amazing in the world's eyes. So it was a big step for me, but I I wanted to follow the Lord. I really did, and I wanted to do.、Um, 
his will and not mine anymore. So I started to um, put more effort into making my Sabbath dresses special um, so that I would also look forward to the Sabbath and I would um, be an example. Remember, we're trying to be examples as well. And I started to wear some dresses like these. They're not too bad, right? In fact, what I am wearing tonight is also one of the dresses I um, designed. <laughs> and um, it didn't just uh, happen to be on Sabbath that I would wear them, but I would even wear them like on red carpet events. Because remember, I, I still get invited to events, but now I would start wearing more modest clothing that would have long sleeves and um, be lengthier and um, no jewelry, very light makeup. Sometimes they would get mad at me and say, why don't you add some, some color to your face and some, some jewelry? It wouldn't hurt. It's just to complete the look. So you have a nice OOTD, you know, but I would tell them. <laughs> Listen, I'm good. I'm good and I'm happy. This is nice for me, you know? And so I kept it simple and I'm modest. And again, I, you know, God is just so kind that um, he'll, he'll let you know that you're on the right track. So remember how I used to do covers for all these different magazines and brands? Guess what? God put me on a cover too. But this time for his glory, you know, and for his purpose. And um, this is probably the, the best um, magazine you want to be on in the Philippines when it comes to Seventh-day Adventism. It's called Health and Home. Um, and it's a hardbound cover. It's only pub published once a year, the hardbound, or printed once a year. They have around 150,000 copies. Like, that's the cap of how many they print. So everyone wants this um, hardbound copy. But you won't believe it. Like, the response that we were getting was so positive. Like, a lot of people started reading this magazine, which had my story, you know, my, my um, appreciation for health, for living, and modest clothing. That, like, a lot of people started reading it. Um, in fact, they had to reprint and they've never done that before because they sold out on the 150,000 copies so it was a really great um, blessing for the literature evangelists because they were able to really sell out um, that year and um, not only did they hear my story but our sisters in the faith back home in the Philippines were also blessed so they also sent me their before and afters <laughs> and I was just so touched because you know, they really, they really show how much happier they are in the present. Amen? Yeah, so I was really, really thankful and blessed to see this result. You know, how God can really use someone, even someone that, you know, may, may have underestimated their ability to be able to serve God under influence. But like he really used this for his purpose. And I'm just thankful that I heeded the call and I was willing. And really God honored um, honored me as well because I was there to serve him John 12 26 if any man serve me him will my father honor and so he finally answered one of my longest and biggest prayers now remember how I had um, that business venture where I was um, I started the, the swimwear line before and that um, went sour and I experienced betrayal etc um, I had been praying that somehow uh, I could help more sisters in the faith dress modestly, especially because they liked what I wore, but um, they didn't know how to have access to it. Because if they would go to, let's say, to the malls and look for modest clothing, they'd maybe find long skirts, but there would be like a high slit, or they would find long sleeve blouses, but they would be plunging necklines or low backs. So it, there was always some sort of compromise. But um, if I could only help my sisters have access to modest clothing that was in line with the health and um, clothing principles um, that are Bible-based, why not? So I could also tie my passion for fashion in there. And I prayed for that because I needed the right people to execute this vision. And lo and behold, um, and two years ago, God finally enabled me through the right people at the right time to start this clothing line called Sura Villa, which takes after my mom's maiden name, because uh, she's also an inspiration to me when it comes to wardrobe and dressing modestly. I started this clothing line. And um, I want to give you guys a sneak peek of the debut collection that I launched, um, because I want to show you that there's so much beauty in modesty. So here are some of the designs that we've created. 
and we consider different body types, different shapes, and different styles for women, but you can still be stylish and modest. In fact, you know, the world is so fixated with how um, the royal family dresses, but if you notice, they really have a modest dress code as well. But we take it a level further, right? Um, like, they just dress that way because um, of their... Um, their own rules and, and monarchy, but um, for us, it's like we, we dress that way because we are God's people. We are separate from the world. Therefore, just by our appearance, the world should already notice the difference. Remember Israel, ancient Israel? They had that blue ribbon attached to their clothing. They had that because it was supposed to be an indication that they were God's people. They didn't dress like the Egyptians. They dressed differently. Um, they dressed modestly. So in our time, people should be able to discern that we are God's people just from how we dress. So our Sabbath dress, yes, we have it. It's special. But if we can dress modestly throughout the week, even better. Because we can also prevent being a stumbling block for men, for instance. Remember? Um, men are very visual. In fact, I just want to share with you briefly, there was a study done, I believe in Harvard, where they tested the impact of a naked woman and a woman in a miniskirt on the brain of men. And believe it or not, they found the in the results that a woman in a miniskirt was more visually stimulating than a naked woman. Can you guess why? I think I heard the right word. Well, when a woman is just covered in a miniskirt, there is just a little bit of room left for a man to imagine and fantasize. But of course, if he sees the whole thing um, up front, like a woman fully naked, there's nothing left to imagine. Like You just see it. Everything's given to you, right? So we have to be very mindful, my dear sisters and um, friends, that uh, we can't always blame the guys for you know, sitting or for, for starting to treat us in a disrespectful way if we ourselves are like all flashy, you know what I mean? I used to be that way, I'm going to admit that, that I would get a lot of confidence from how many guys had a crush on me when I was younger. Like the more guys liked me, the more confident I became. But that's like a really dangerous way to think because we should never derive our confidence from humans or the opposite sex. Like we should build our own values and foundation and principles um, centered on the Lord because that is unmovable and he is faithful until the end. God keeps his promises. So we need to make sure that we're, we're on the right page with God, not with like what other guys think of us. Yeah, so... Again, when we go back to addressing modesty, because this is a really important topic for our, um, our sisters and the women in our generation, right? Um, less skin showing is more and better. <laughs> okay, so the more we cover up, we also start to attract the right type of man we would like to end up with. Because if you cover up and you're simple and that captures the attention of a man, you know that he appreciates you for your natural beauty. And also, um, he, has, he has other interests that he looks for, not just how you look outwardly, right? He looks at your heart. He appreciates who you are and your foundation, which should be Christ. So this is my own way of, I guess, compensating and making up uh, for the industry that once completely, you know, carried me away with glamour and fashion because I am technically still in the fashion industry. But now I, I believe that God is using this opportunity for me to share a type of fashion in this industry that is lacking and that we need access to, which is modest clothing. And uh, just to add more um, of the outreach um, or missionary aspect to it, I've also included uh, hang tags on every clothing that is purchased with uh, the Bible verses of 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. And I made sure I specifically said there, use me as a bookmark so they don't throw it away. So at least in little ways you can get creative of how you can, you know, do your ministries. Um, and if there's something that you're interested in, there, there may be creative ways 
um, to include and lead people to the Lord. And it's just been amazing because I thought only Seventh-day Adventist women would resonate with this kind of fashion. But believe it or not, if you're active on Instagram, you can check this out later, um, celebrities have started to appreciate this kind of fashion as well. We've dressed women uh, like Megan Young, that's her handle on Instagram. Uh, she's Miss World 2013. She has 2.2 million followers. So she also has an appreciation for modesty and would wear our designs. Also, another celebrity in the Philippines who's really famous is an actress called Colleen Garcia. So we dressed her for her prenuptial, which was so shot in South Africa. Um, she has 4.3 million followers. So we, since we have like customization, we can adjust according to what is required for the woman's body type or needs. But we always make sure we push for a modest design. So, of course, celebrities want to be a bit more revealing, but this may be the most revealing that we would go, you know? Like, Bea Alonzo also has 4 million followers. She's a top actress in our country. So, you know, God really can bless these kinds of efforts to serve him in industries like fashion. So I'm really thankful that um, he's managed to um, use me um, in this really dangerous industry to still be a light somehow. And it's not even ended there. You know, I was already happy dressing these women, but God is just so amazing. I mean, he even allowed us to enter the corporate world now where we can dress um, people um, and their private uniforms, corporate uniforms, and now we're into weddings, and a lot of Seventh-day Adventist brides-to-be are um, coming to us to dress them for their wedding day, and we've even dressed um, the choir of the Office of the President of the Republic of the Philippines. Not bad, right? So step by step, modesty is making its way through the different sectors of fashion, and I thank the Lord, um, you know, for this wonderful gift, because really it is a testimony in itself, and um, we also try to make sure that we remain in the Lord. We don't get too carried away, so our work hours do not compromise our health. We have regular Bible study with our employees to make sure that we share the light. Because the truth is that, you know, at the end of the day, even if we may be successful in one thing and it seems like God is blessing us, the bottom line is salvation. And so we need to make sure that in whatever it is we do, we're still soul winning, right? And um, to close, I would just like to leave you with a really important um, Bible verse. In fact, this Bible verse is a, a verse that Satan hates because um, it gives hope to humanity. It is very short and simple. And he hates it so much that if you look at different Bible versions, it's missing in certain Bibles. So I'm sure you're curious to find out what verse that is. It is... Um, Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man came to save that which was lost. When Jesus came down on earth, you know, he, he had one mission, and that mission was to save us. And our salvation really depended on his decision, on whether he was able to bear that cup. And three times he asked his father, you know, if it is possible to take away this cup from him. Nevertheless, his will be done. Because the human side of Jesus also really, you know, struggled. And I know a lot of us are struggling today as well to follow Jesus, to make these sacrifices, to give up things that have been a big part of us, have shaped us, um, have built our identity, so to speak. But if Jesus came to save that which was lost, which include you and I, our mission should be the same as Christ, right? He found us, and now we may not be as lost as we once were because we're now on the right track. We have these precious lights. The Holy Spirit has been calling us. He's been whispering through us, through friends, through family, through social media through messages, through simple experiences, and sometimes even through the death of loved ones. God is calling us today. So at the end of the day, it really is a choice because God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself upon anyone. But as it says in the same passage, God loves 
you so much that if you were part of a herd of sheep and you went astray, he would leave the 99 and go to the ends of the earth to bring you back. That is how much he loves you and I. And the least we can do is return the favor, acknowledge the death and the sacrifice on the cross by giving our lives to him and also bringing more souls to his feet. Because if you really have the love of Christ in you, you will not hate. You will want everyone or as many as possible to be saved. You just want that because that's what Christ wanted. Even when he was on the cross, his words were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He did not want his father to give up on us. He was mediating so that his father could consider us because we would be lost if Jesus didn't do that for us. And so, lastly, I just want to share something that I learned only this year at 34 years old, that when Jesus, who is spotless of sin, made that sacrifice, I always imagine him to be as white as snow. And that final day, as it, he was leading up to the cross, getting beaten up, tortured, by so many people, spat at, humiliated, put down, um, accused. He was starting to bear every person's sin, right? So that purity of him physically was starting to get more and more tainted to the point that he was covered in our sins. And, and remember, there is something that separates us from God. One thing that separates us from God. What is that one thing? Sin. So take it a level further. If Jesus was covered in our sins, what happened to his relationship with his heavenly father? He was more and more separated from his own heavenly father. And that's why he said those words. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? because he couldn't feel his father's presence anymore because he was wrapped up in our sins. This innocent man with so much love for us that even Satan couldn't fathom. How can he do this for them? He could just call his army. He could just rescue himself out of this position right now. But he, that love is just something that we will keep talking about even when we reach heaven. You know, so keeping that um, in our hearts that he he went through this for us he sacrificed his own relationship with his heavenly father to be separated from his heavenly father and to be all alone on the cross that like really really hit me hard and you know what's interesting ellen white writes that jesus didn't know that his heavenly father actually didn't leave him right he he just because he had to live by the rules, sin separates from the Heavenly Father, he really felt like he died alone. But during that hour, those three hours, where the earth was covered in darkness, that was the Heavenly Father's doing. Because, of course, if he, he would come in the light, his glory would kill everyone. But um, he came to cover his glory, and he was right there next to Jesus at the cross with all these angels, but Jesus didn't know it. So for me, like to just learn about this at the age of 34, better late than never, I say, but imagine like if people knew the sacrifice that he made at a much younger age, wow, this is powerful. This is powerful in finishing God's last work. So as I close tonight, you can see from my life, which include many decisions that I wasn't proud of and many choices I made that I could easily regret. But you can see that it is not too late to choose your influence for a good cause. 
to choose your influence to serve God. And you can see that if I can do it, even at this age and, and that part of the world, you can do it too, right? We all have our unique gifts, our, our own talents, our own beauty um, to use this for the ministry and to bring more souls to Jesus. As I said, there are many more lost Sandras out there that are waiting for you guys to be the light and to share the light. So I would just like to appeal to you tonight two things. The first appeal is who here is willing to kill their curiosity for good about what else they can aspire to achieve and to obtain in the world, in this fleeting world. Just kill that and decide to go all in with God and ask God to lead you all the way so that you can be a vessel and a light for his eternal kingdom and his final work. And the second appeal I want to make to all of you is who here wants to be saved and also for your loved ones and more souls out there to be saved. So if you feel that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you tonight and that this message has touched you in a simple way, that you want to let go of what you previously desired, what you had previously planned for your future life, and really just follow the Lord Know that his plan for you is perfect, just like his way was better than my way. And he still gave me everything that I wanted and more in his own way. So if you resonate with this tonight, I would love for you to come forward and join me so that we can pray together as we move forward in our journey with the Lord. Don't be shy. Don't hold back. This is actually not about you or me, how many people are up here, but really just letting God know that you are ready to follow him. And you, you don't want to be curious anymore about what's out there because people like Sandra have been there and it's really not that great and the grass really isn't greener and the ending isn't, you know, greener pastures. It really is fleeting, temporary, it's a mess. We don't want to be part of this world anymore. We are ready for eternal life. We are not here to obtain earthly crowns. We are here to stand in front of our King, our Lord, as queens and princes and princesses, worshiping our creator face to face side by side with the angels amen praise god and you know as much as you may have been blessed tonight by god's words that um, i've shared through my simple testimony i want you to know that i too am very very blessed to be a part of god's work to be here tonight and to see all of your faces Thank you for not walking out. Thank you for really just listening, lending your time. And I know that heaven is rejoicing right now. And, you know, just I was just praying for one soul. One soul. And might be good, but we have way more than one soul. So, praise the Lord. And remember, it's, it's a battlefield out there. Ephesians 6.12 really makes that clear. We wrestle not against your neighbor or that that crazy truck driver or that, 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 that girl that always dresses better than you. It's not about them. It's really about principalities against the rulers of darkness, evil, and good. So as you move forward after this day, always remember that it's not going to be easy, but it's not impossible, right? may fall but you keep rising up you keep staying strong in the lord 
Do not get discouraged, because the moment you do it, the enemy wins. Just hold on, stay put, and focus on the narrow path. Think long term. Okay, let's pray. Our most loving Heavenly Father, thank you very, very much for this moment, this simple moment in time that you have brought all of us together to discover your love, your plans for us, and the potential that's out there for us to do mighty works for your kingdom. Lord, we can see that through our simple talent and our influence, our beauty that we can bring more souls to you Lord we were commissioned to serve thee and also to help others that have yet to discover this light serve thee too Lord we know that we don't have much time left we are in overtime and Jesus is pleading in the most holy place in heaven to give us more time, to buy us more time so that we can make those decisions and those choices to serve you, Lord, and to follow you and to honor you and to bring our loved ones with us and those that we will still reach in our lives. Lord, these wonderful, precious souls have responded to this simple appeal, Lord, not to be curious anymore of what else the world can offer them because they've realized that this is all temporary fleeting and ultimately ends in destruction and unhappiness so please lord protect them in the palm of your hand and guide them as they move forward and as they make small but important decisions each day of their lives and also as they make choices because we realize that our example can affect other souls too. So help us to set the right examples. And Lord, for everything that we have done wrong, for everything in which we have offended Thee, simply from our old past and self, we ask for forgiveness and we know that You can renew us and make us white as snow again. So we remove the old man the old woman and we start fresh tonight so thank you so much lord for this wonderful blessing and for bringing us together at this present time lord be with these souls be with me as well help us to carry on in strength and in faith and help us never to be ashamed of the true gospel and of our heavenly father and his sacrifice on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' sweet and mighty name. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. In the light of his word, what a glory he shed.